calling this our third Sunday of I Love My Church Month. I'm preaching a series of messages entitled, All You Need Is Love. And uh, I'm going to be doing that in just a moment. But we are delighted to have today Nancy Knowlton, director of the Cookville Pregnancy Clinic, and our friend to be with us. God bless you, Nancy. The picture that you see on the screen, of course, is uh, of last week, one of the uh, ones that was taken, and it was just a tremendous day to be here in, in God's house, and we're so thankful for our work and the opportunity to be a part of God's kingdom uh, development on this earth, and I appreciate you for your involvement in our church on a, on a consistent basis and uh, giving your best to God to help us establish our ministry not for our glory, but for his. This is the third week that I'm preaching the sermon series, All You Need Is Love. And the text today is from the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 through 7. The scripture says, Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. Where 
does love take us? You know, in life, we end up at a position other than where you started and you could not have foreseen where you were going. Um, many times people will say, if I'd known where this road would take me, I might have been afraid to go out on that road. And um, that's true of a lot of things in life. And the consuming loves that we have in our lives, the important loves, will take us places in life. Where does love take us? What is our destination if we have love? Now, the female in the Song of Solomon, as you know from reading the book, uh, part of it's done in a male voice and part of it's in a female voice, and this is the female voice here, um, she's speaking to her loved one in the text. And she says, place me like a seal on your heart, like a seal on your arm. If we were saying that, those same words today, we might say, place me like a tattoo over your heart or a tattoo on your arm. And of course, you're real familiar with that, um, of how a person will have another person's name tattooed on their arm. You're probably also familiar with those who try to cover up that tattoo uh, at, at a later point. And uh, I had a, one of my professors at Tech when I was in school over there, he said that um, one of his relations had been in a relationship with a, a young lady named Sheila, and they broke up. And he had gotten her name tattooed on his arm. And so his question to the, my professor was, do you know any girls named Sheila? <laughs> but I want to be on your heart and on your person. Now, we do the same type of thing in other ways. Other ways, we'll wear a, a uh, wedding ring or a, uh, some type of other type of jewelry or articles of clothing that indicate our relationship to the loved one. And so the, the lady here says, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as a grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. And so she's saying, if you love me, then these things are possible. I say possible. In life, there's a lot of things that are possible that may not ever become true in actuality but they become possible when we look at things a certain way. And we have a little uh, statement, a little, little card in our, in our home that says, that says, faith does not ensure that all things happen, but it ensures that all things are possible. Now, I don't know where love will take you in your life, and you may not know where it's going to take me, but I'm going to talk about some places that it can take us. What are some aspects of love. Let's look at them. Uh, the first thing we see in the text is we see strong love. Strong love. The lady said, love is as strong as death. Now, death trumps all other concerns. Okay? A person has their life going a certain way, and then they die, and all those bets are off. Because things are different now. Death trumps all of the concern. And she said, love is as strong as death. In other words, love trumps all other concerns. Now, we've all got responsibilities in life and obligations, and we should be true to those obligations. It, it, is, it is frustrating to have people that are supposed to do certain things, not come through, okay? So we have to fulfill our obligations. But love trumps all obligations. In other words, it cancels all other debts because it is as strong as death. Love is binding. And 
and we were talking about the strength of love and in the uh, book of the Song of Solomon, also the book of Proverbs, other places in Scripture, the strength of love is attested to. But let me also say this. In another sense, love is also fragile. It's fragile because it has to be nurtured to remain strong. And so while love is strong and binding and trumps all other, all other concerns, we're all familiar with situations if it didn't happen to us, it happened to someone else, and it may not have been a romantic love, but it was a type of love where for some reason that love just died. It just died. The Shulamite woman, and that's a woman of Shula, that's who this is, wanted love from the protagonist. And she wants to be a mark on his heart and on his body. Would be like the tattoo. Now, this idea of having something on your heart is seen in Scripture another couple of times. It was God's will that His law be written on our heart and not on tablets of stone, as Scripture tells us. So we have God's concern on our heart. Because the things that are closest to you are the things in your life that will be done. Now something else. The Bible says here that love has unyielding jealousy. Love is strong as death. Uh, it's jealousy as unyielding as the grave. In other words, the grave never gives anything to us. And there's a type of jealousy that goes along with love. Now the Bible says that God's a jealous God. So we need not think of jealousy in a negative light, although we can. Jealousy can be a very negative thing, but it's not necessarily so. God is a jealous God, which means God wants us to worship him and that's all. Now if people have love between them, there's a certain jealousy in that love in that they don't want that person loving someone else too. Because that's what love is. And so it has an unyielding jealousy. In other words, there are some things that if they become a part of you because of love, you will have a great zeal to accomplish those things see those things done in your life. Because you'll have a jealousy to bring that about in your life and not just let it. Which is something we read in the book. One of my uh, films that I, that I like a lot, um, Christmas film, in which George Bailey um, in speaking to a, a female in the show, she says to him, George, don't you ever get tired of just reading about things? Does that ever hit you with regard to the things of God? Ain't it any good to read, read about what's happening in the book to somebody? Wouldn't you like to have that happen to you? Or at least something like it, you know, just so there will be more to me than just having Watch the film about something. Is there not something I can do? Let none hear you idly saying, there is nothing I can do. Is there something that I can do? I am grateful for mission works around the world and that the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached in every corner of the world. Covering the globe. And I'm grateful for people that are willing to take that position and, and, and responsibility on to take the gospel of Christ to lands unknown. And a lot of times we do things in the church where we will send a group to another place like 
Central America or South America or Africa or Mexico or somewhere, and we call those mission trips. And thank goodness for everybody who participates in those and funds those and the ones who will go on those. But you don't have to do that to do something for God. And it is, it is wrong for us to think that, that because we are praying for a missionary somewhere around the world means we don't have to walk across the street. There are people that live next door to you. There are folks that you work on the job with. There are people that you know through the school system. There are folks all around that need Jesus Christ, and we don't need to only be giving money to someone else to do the work or think that we need to go to some far and distant land to accomplish the work of God. Hell is the same for the lost that are in Cookville as it is for the lost in Bangladesh. And there's something you can do. And that strong love that you and I should have for the things of God, that conviction uh, about the work of God, there ought to be an element of jealousy in it in that we want to do it for ourselves, just as there's an element of jealousy involved in love, which says, I want to be the one that loves you. And I want to be yours, and I want you to be mine, and we're together bound in a strong bond. And we need to have a strong conviction about the work of God today. There's somebody that may spend an eternity apart from God except for you. You may be God's contact point. Very often, we'll see folks, they'll bring someone to church and they'll say, this is my friend, and uh, we've been to school together at Prescott Middle School, or something like that. I've known them for a long time. That's a person I don't know. I'm not the contact point for that person. You are. But we never accomplish very much, whether it's in our personal lives, in our corporate lives as a church or in the work of God until we come under the conviction of a strong love that we have to be, be actively involved in that involves an element of jealousy that says, I am going to do it. So love is strong with unyielding jealousy. Secondly, burning love. Tell us your hand I don't know my point. Love is like a fire that consumes. It's a fire that consumes. Now, I don't know if you like to burn things, but I always did. Some of you may remember that not long into the burning, or to the, into the starting of our church, I was burning trash in the backyard, as is absolutely legal according to city codes. <laughs> and there was an aerosol can in it. It blew up right next to me. I, I, I was surprised that, you know, luckily nothing happened to me, but uh, I used to be more that way than I am now. And I'll tell you, the, tell you how that happened. When I was growing up in Nashville, Tennessee, people had, in, in Nashville, there are alleys. There are not many alleys in Cookville. There are some. But, you know, here's the street, here's the street, houses on either side, there's an alley, you know, one lane. And a lot of people had incinerators on the alley next to their trash can. There's little wire baskets, sometimes maybe almost as tall as this. You just put your trash in and you burn it. You do that all the time. And that was one of my jobs. And so I was, I was, I was out there just burning the trash. And that's just the way it was done uh, back in the Paleolithic years. <laughs> so that's why I like so. So I'm supposed to, to cut a little bush down in the yard. I want to just light it on fire. That'll take it down. I was doing that in North Carolina years and years ago. And uh, the wind got up. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm going to burn this neighborhood down. I had about 
about an acre of land, about half of it was just rough and, and, and would grow up in grass. I'd, you know, chop it down once every so often, but I always have to get to use somebody else's equipment. That's when I just learned that thing off. And so it started kind of getting to where I was not comfortable with it. So I, I went and got my garden hose. The garden hose made it right to the edge of where the fire was. I turned that thing on as powerful as I could. I think it was two garden hoses right together. It just barely dribbled out the end of that thing. I thought, I don't know. I ran around in front of that thing, took my jacket off, and, and beat on it. I thought, if, if it burns this place down, it's burning me down with it. Uh, it didn't do much to me, but it destroyed that cover. It was a consuming fire that roars out of control. Now, see, that's the thing about a fire. You'll think you can't control it. And then something else will happen. And love is like a consuming fire when it gets out of control. When you fall in love, you don't have any idea what you're doing. <laughs> you're doing the stuff you're doing, everybody else thinks is crazy. You're the only person who it makes sense. <laughs> because it got out of control. Everybody else is shaking their head. I don't know what is wrong with that girl. <laughs> but you don't get it because it's you. And that's why the scripture says love is like a consuming fire. It takes precedent in the life. As a matter of fact, she goes on and says it cannot be quenched. It cannot be quenched. It evaporates the waters that try to extinguish it. You've been aware, no doubt, of some of the fires that were in the West. And remember the one in Gatlinburg that there was one not too long ago. Do you remember that one? You know, when those fires get going, they can't put them out. People just got to move. They can't put them out. Have you seen them dropping these? Several tons of water from a, an airplane. Have you noticed how puny that looks next to the fire that's underneath it? And so when you try to extinguish the fire of love, it evaporates the water. Rivers cannot sweep it away. We not only need a conviction on the work of God, we need a conviction on the lostness of men and women. When people die without Christ, they go to hell. To say anything different is lying to people. And we've lied to people for too long. We may not have said it with our mouth. But we've almost made people think that if they live a certain way, that they will be fine. They're not. And you may be the contact point. We not only need a conviction on the lostness of people, but we need a conviction that we're the ones that have to make the effort. People will say things like this. They'll say, they'll say, uh, well, I would try to witness to them, but I don't really know what to say. Yeah, me neither. I've been doing it all my life, and there are still times when the words don't come. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that guy that, that falls in love, and he says, he says, you know, I really, I really love this lady, but uh I'll tell you what, there's just one thing about it. I'm just too shy. Well, she's going to go with somebody else. That's how that works. When you get convicted about the losses of your friends and the losses of men and women in general, you do something about it. You do something about it. And it won't be as important as the exact words that are said. By the way, it's not the words you say anyway, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
But you do something. Oh, yeah, and by the way, let me say that I do know what it's like to kind of be so close to somebody you almost need somebody else to talk to them, you know, because that, that, that does happen sometimes. But there's something that you can do. There's something that you can do. But you won't do it without conviction that you have to do it. Because you'll do what you have to do. That thing that takes precedent over everything else, that thing that trumps all concerns, you'll do that. You need a conviction about the importance of God's work and the lostness of men and women. And when we get that kind of love in our lives for the things of God, you can't put that out. You can't put that out. Now, you're not uncommon if you go through times of backsliding. That's the typical Christian life for everybody. Preachers, everybody else. It's, it's typical that people go through these times where they wax and wane in their relationship to God. Doesn't mean the love is not there. You've got to work on it. Why? Because love is fragile. Remember? Love is strong, but it's also fragile. And so you keep working on that. So we've seen strong love. We've seen burning love. But we've also seen costly love. We see costly love. Now, the King James Version says, for the NIV says, if one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be ugly scorn. King James Version says it would be ugly condemned. In other words, nothing valuable in this house anymore. You know, things, a lot of things in life, maybe most things, they sort of have a time stamp on them. I go to work every morning a, a certain way, and there's an old house that's part of my journey. It's not actually very far from where I live. There's an old house that's boarded up. And every time I go through <clears throat> or go next to hear a, a dwelling like that, it always makes me kind of sad because the thing I think is, I think, what there was time when this was somebody's dream. You know, and it may be somebody really <coughs> came over here. And, and don't you think that, that person that was, when they got into that place, they were so excited because they just got in there and it was, it was such a big deal. And now it's boarded up and, and all that is gone. And I went by there the other day and the house not there anymore. Big piece of earth moving equipment there, and a tree, a large tree that was laid over on its side. And I thought about the fact that there are things that people get really excited about, and things that people are really uh, attracted to and involved with, and and then one day they just they just stop. They just stop. And pretty soon that opportunity is not even there anymore. Not even there anymore. And a whole way of life is perished. And an opportunity is gone. Some of you remember right over, not very far from here, in that direction, the cross of where CVS is and Walgreens and all that at that intersection and up on the government housing is over there. Any of you ever go over there with me? It's on your own. We saw dozens, even hundreds of people over the years, and some accepted Christ, and some moved other places, and nobody's going over there anymore because all that's gone. And one day, the opportunity <coughs> for you to love will be gone. And one day, there will be a chance for you to win someone to Christ because they'll be gone if they're not dead. And this life will end for them and eternity will commence. You gave everything that you had in your house for love, there wouldn't be anything left. Valuable things are valuable.
valuable? He calls us heads. And this type of consuming love is difficult to come by. But where might love lead us? Where might love lead us? This strong, burning, costly love. Number one, it might lead us to take a stand. Now, <clears throat> I think when I was a younger person that I looked for opportunities to take a stand. Um, sometimes beyond what was warranted. You know how you are? You know, when you're young, kind of rash, you know, and as you get older, you kind of mellow out a little bit. You have to be careful that you not become a person that used to take a stand and never take a stand. Love might make you take a stand. We ought to make our love known. That's part of what I mean. Love brings a mark emotionally and physically. If you've got something on your heart, like the Shulamite wanted to be, if you've got something that's on your heart, you talk about it. You'll talk about it. And if you've got something on your heart, then the things you do will be indicative of that love. It'll be emotional and it'll be physical. The love might lead you to take a stand. Where might love lead us? Well, it might lead us to sickness and death. Now that's a cheery thought when we think about love. Something on your mind, you can't think about anything else. You don't know what you're doing. You're about to get fired from your job. You know, <laughs> and, uh, it's it just you, you don't you feel queasy in your stomach. You got a headache. You know, it, love love might lead you to sickness and death. I, I will tell you this: love for the cause of Christ had to lead some people to death. Good answer. Because love takes you wherever it is you need to go for its sake. That's where love takes you. There are some people that the work of God will involve things that seem to be on the upside almost all the time. There are some people for whom the work of God may bring about heartbreak. But that's where love will take you. And some of you here today, and maybe everybody, or very nearly everybody, you know what it's like to have something that takes you so much that you carry an eternal sadness or an eternal burden without love like it. Because that's where love takes you. Where might love take us? Well, it might lead us to uncontrollable jealousy because we are possessive over the love Do the things of God possess us that way where they mean so much to us that we have to be involved in them? They have to be a part of our lives because that's what we love. Where might love lead us? Well, it might lead us to a burden. Now, unquenchable love consumes us. Prophet Jeremiah said, So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Jeremiah, because of the great blowback that he got for being a prophet and for proclaiming the word of the Lord, he said, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. But it was, it, was so, it was in him to such a degree that it had to have an outlet. And that's the way the love is. It's got to come out somewhere. 
And the things of God so consumed Jeremiah and burned within him that he couldn't do anything else. And love might lead us to burn. It also might lead us to give everything that we are. To give everything that we are. Edward VIII, after ruling for less than a year, Edward VIII became the first English monarch to voluntarily abdicate the throne. He chose to abdicate the British government, the public, and the Church of England, condemned his decision to marry the American divorcee, Wallace Warfield Sampson. Sampson. The Duke said that he did not once regret his decision to abdicate because he was so happy. Why did he do that? Because many waters cannot quench love. The flood can't drown. Because love is as strong as death. It is, it is jealous that is unrelenting as the grave. It is powerful, burning, and hurting and dying. <laughs> Whatever you abandon from Christ, will be a pale reflection of his loss for you. Now, why was it that Jesus died for us in the first place? Well, part of the answer to that reason, uh, the reason is the fact that he saw beyond the death and beyond the suffering to the goal, the prize of reconciling the world to himself. And isn't that the way that love comes Sometimes it's, it's just like you kind of have to look past the uh, immediate negative and say, I've got to remember that love. I've got to remember that love. i got to stay on track. You know, that's how we are in the Christian life. But whatever we abandon for Christ will be a pale reflection of his loss for our sake. Now, the interesting thing is in Philippians chapter 2, the scripture says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That's what Jesus did for us. Here's the interesting thing about that verse. The verse says at the outset, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In other words, in this verse, or these verses, to tell us that we're supposed to remember what Jesus did for us, it's not telling us that only to make us have a love for God. It says in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is talking about Christians to one another. You and I are supposed to have a mindset of loss with regard to other believers. In other words, preferring others before yourself. I'm going to be concerned about your welfare and you're going to be concerned about mine. Why? Because that's what Jesus did when he left heaven to die on the cross. And I not only am grateful to him, but I put that, I apply that to my relationship with you. And so we're to manifest the love of Christ in our relationships in the church. The first week I was preaching this, this series, the, the scripture tells us that all people will know that we are the disciples of Christ if we have love for one another. Why is that? Because everyone understands love. Not everyone understands convictions, although those are important. Not everyone understands the Bible, although 
we would like for them to, but everybody understands love. We need a strong conviction today in the cost of discipleship. Salvation is expensive. It costs. And it also costs. Salvation ought to cost money. It ought to cost time. It ought to cost the abandoning of your entire life's plan if that's God's will. Because that is where love takes us in the service of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Love is powerful. It is also fragile. And love is expensive. I don't know where your love for Christ, your love for the work of God, will take you. But it should move you because it is strong, burning, this week. This is a time that we give back. And I'm just going to ask you to pass the plates down the road that you are on to the road behind. And I thank you for your giving and for your willingness to be a part of the work of God on this earth and in our ministry. Let me remind you of our open house. That is from 2 to 5 next Saturday. Certainly tell other people about it, invite people to be a part of that. Also, we can have a fellowship meal on the 27th, that'll be at 6 o'clock. That'll be the Sunday night. Uh, open house 26, and that's the 27th. Thank you for your giving toward the Cookville Pregnancy Clinic and their valuable ministry. Nell and Lisa Carver wedding celebration, March the 19th, right in the midst of the Easter season. Ash Wednesday is March the 2nd, Palm Sunday is April 10th, and Easter and our church's anniversary celebration is on the 17th of the month of April. Let me ask you to stand with us, please. I appreciate you being here. Let's repeat together the prayer of lifting up of hands and the ironic blessing. Will you join me, please? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. 